And I'd like us to pray, first of all. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bow in your presence. And I pray, dear Lord, that this morning, even as we have sensed your presence, as we've sung your praises, even now, Lord, anoint my lips, my mind, and strengthen me that I might proclaim your word boldly and with clarity, and may your Holy Spirit take it into our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I thank the Lord for the word of God. And in these last closing days of time, we need to preach the Word of God. I so appreciate the Word of God that goes forth from this pulpit Sunday by Sunday, the Scriptures being exposited. And I trust that what I have to share this morning will contribute towards that. Uh, you know, the book of Ephesians could be divided into three parts. First of all, the first three chapters speak about our blessings in Christ, our spiritual wealth, our riches, the riches of his grace. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So our spiritual wealth as believers in Christ, our blessings. Then the second section of the book of Ephesians especially from chapter 4 onwards, could speak about our spiritual walk as believers in Christ. And then the last section that was read, Ephesians 6, 10 to 19, our spiritual warfare as believers in Christ. All three sections are very, very important. We need to know, first of all, our spiritual blessings in Christ. They are outlined there. Paul lines them up, lists them. We have been chosen in him. We have been adopted into the family of God. We are accepted in the beloved. He has a plan for us. We have been redeemed with his precious blood. And through his precious blood, we have forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. He has a plan for our lives, for the future, a hope. And you get to verse 13. We, he has given us the seal of the Holy Spirit. And as you go through the book of Ephesians, Paul emphasizes the importance of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Then near the end of chapter 1, Paul prays for the church at Ephesus, but that prayer is for all of us that we might come to know the Lord better, that we are, the eyes of our hearts would be opened so we would grasp how we are his inheritance and see the hope of his calling. And then he says that we might come to know, and hear it closely, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? What kind of power? It's power. It's exceeding power. It's the exceeding greatness of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. I was so blessed with that first uh, hymn, that first chorus. He's alive today. He is risen from the dead. Listen. When God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That was the greatest miracle that has ever happened because death had to be overcome. When Jesus rose from the dead, he overcame death. He overcame the power of the Roman army. He overcame the power of Satan. Satan and all his demonic forces tried to keep Jesus Christ in the grave. But he had said he would rise the third day. And on the third day, an angel of God descended 
and rolled back the stone, not to let Jesus out. He had already arisen. He was alive. He rolled the stone away so that the women who came to the tomb and the disciples could go in and see that the body was gone. He had risen from the dead. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And then, remember, for 40 days, he showed himself alive, speaking with them, teaching them. He ate with them. He was with them. He showed them his hands. He showed them his side, the wounds, the scars. He was indeed alive. He said, handle me and see. For a spirit, some of them thought this is just a ghost. He said, look, handle me and see. For a ghost, a spirit, doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. It is I, I have risen like I said I would. He ate with them. For 40 days he was with them, showing himself, preaching, teaching them. And then remember they led him. He led them out as far as the Mount of Olives. And as he lifted up his hands and blessed them, he was parted from them and ascended up to heaven. And the Bible says he sat down on the right hand of God the Father. He had completed the work of redemption. You sit down when you complete a job. You can rest now. He sat down on the right hand of God. Paul prayed that we might come to understand the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. What kind of power? What kind of power is available for us as believers? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and raised him up and set him at the right hand of God. Now hear the rest of it. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world or this age, but in that which hath to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to his church, which is his body. We are his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Think of it. Jesus Christ, who was crucified, whose blood was shed to redeem us, who was put in the grave, a stone rolled over it, he rose the third day. And today he is seated at the right hand of God. He was raised up far above principalities, powers, might, every name that is named, no matter what name it is, he has a name above every name. Hallelujah. He is exalted above every other power. He is exalted above the devil, above principalities, demon princes, powers, evil spirits. They're under his feet. Christ arose victoriously. He left behind him an eternally defeated devil and his demonic hordes. He bruised the head of the serpent. God promised in the Garden of Eden that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. And that day at Calvary and in the resurrection, Satan's head, his authority was bruised. It says in Colossians 2.15 that he spoiled principalities and powers and evil spirits triumphing over them in his death on the cross for our benefit. And Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they would, their eyes, their spiritual eyes would be opened to see this exceeding power, this exceeding great power, this resurrection power, which is available to us, his church, 
which is his body. The word I want you to notice there is that Jesus has been seated. The word sit. And then in chapter 2, Paul says, You hath he made alive, who were dead. We were dead spiritually. If you're not a real born-again Christian, you are spiritually dead. But it says here to the Ephesians and to all believers, You hath he made alive, quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked, according to the course of this world, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And Paul says, among whom all of us had our conduct in time past, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Now hear that verse. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, oh, I love that, his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead spiritually, dead in sins, hath made us alive together with Christ and hath raised us up, and here's the word, that, and seated us together, seated us in Christ. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. If you're a believer, if you're born again, if you have received the life of Christ within you, is he has saved you by his grace, he raised you out of your spiritual death, out of your sin, and he's lifted you up and placed you in Christ. Where is Christ? At the right hand of God, seated. And you are seated there with him in heavenly places, in that place of rest, that place of victory, that place of authority. Now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. When we say right hand, it means a place of authority. Seated means he is resting. He completed the work. Hebrews 10 says, This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He completed the work. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. But we as believers were in Christ and were seated with him in that place of rest, that place of victory, that place of authority, the right hand of God. Listen, God sees you as a believer, all of you. He sees you in his son, Jesus, and he sees you at the very right hand of God, a place of rest in him. Hebrews 4, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. You can rest. He has raised you out of your death, out of your sin, out of your bondage. You're in Christ. You're in him. He's seated, speaks of his rest, but also speaks of victory and authority. Christ, God has raised you and I as believers to a place of victory, a place of authority in Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go you therefore. He has all authority. And as believers, he's the head of the church. We are his church, his body. He has left us here in this world to continue the work. He's left us here so he can work through us. He's the head. We're his body. He has all authority, and he delegates that authority down to us, his body. So the first word I want you to see is sit. We are seated together with Christ where he is seated. The second word, it's in verse 10, 
chapter 2, it says, We're saved by grace through faith, and verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, before God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, we cannot work for our salvation. After we are saved by grace through faith without works, we're born again. Now that we are alive, we were spiritually dead. Now we're alive and we've been resting at the right hand of God, a place of rest. You can't really walk before you rest. So we rest in him, but we also are walking. In chapter 4, verse 1 says, that he implored us, beseeches believers, that they walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. We are in, heavenly, in the heavenly realms. That's our position. But we are still here in this world. He has left us here to be salt and light. And it says we are to walk worthy of this high calling, being in Christ, adopted into the family of God, redeemed by his blood, accepted in the beloved, sealed by his spirit, part of the family of God. He's our father. Oh, walk worthy of this high calling. Then chapter 4, verse 17, it says, we are not to walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Our walk as believers is to be different. You know, people do not always listen to what we say, but they watch how we walk, our conduct. As believers, clothed in the righteousness of God, cleansed in the blood of Jesus, children of God, we're to walk in such a way that we reflect the Lord's glory and attract men and women. Walk worthy of the vocation. Walk different to the unsaved, not as other Gentiles walk. We're to walk in purity, in godliness, in holiness. Then it speaks there, about walking in love as Christ also loved us at the end of the chapter. Before we are saved, there's bitterness, there's hatred, there's unforgiveness, there's anger. But now that we've been born again, we've received the new nature, the very nature of God within us, which is a nature of love. God is love. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So now we are to walk in love. Paul says, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ hath forgiven you. He speaks about, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Do you realize if you go to bed at night with anger, and bitterness in your heart, you're opening the door for the enemy to attack you. Confess that before you go to bed. Maintain an attitude of love and forgiveness. Guard against bitterness. Unforgiveness and bitterness is like putting sand in the motor of an engine. It'll cause you problems. Walk in love. Then in chapter 5, it speaks about Walk as children of light. You were once darkness in the Lord. We were in the realm of darkness. Now we're to walk as children of light. It also says we are to walk circumspectly or carefully. The devil has snares and pitfalls. We need to walk carefully in a way that's honoring and pleasing to the Lord, redeeming the time. But you know, this type of walk is only possible as we live and walk in the Spirit. It says in verse 18 of chapter 5, Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. As we are filled with the Spirit and live and walk in the Spirit, 
it will impact our lives and it'll impact our marriage in chapter 5. That love will overflow between husband and wife, between parents and children. In the church, it'll be an attitude of godly love. That's speaking of our love that God gives us, His love, His love, divine love. So we have read about our position in Christ. We are seated together with Christ. Then down here, we are to walk in a way that's honorable in the sight. But then as you get into chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, finally, brethren, he left this to the end. He first of all clearly showed them their position in Christ, the victory of Christ over Satan and his demonic hordes, and how believers should, they're in Christ, seated with him in that place of victory. And he exhorts them how they should live and walk down here. Then, in verse 10 of chapter 6, he says, Finally, brethren, and that applies to sisters, be strong. How? In the Lord. And in the power of his might. What kind of might? The might that raised Jesus from the dead. That power. That exceeding great power, might, that God exercised when he raised Jesus from the dead. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And hear it. Put on the whole armor of God, not some, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand. That's the third word. Sit, walk, stand. I'm thankful for a little booklet that I read many years ago in Africa by Watchman Nee. Sit, walk, stand. If you've never read it, try and find it. I don't know where you can get it, but it'll be a blessing to you. I read this probably 40 years ago. I don't remember too much, but I remember the title. It helped me understand this book of Ephesians. We are seated with Christ, a place of rest, a place of victory. But we are called upon to walk worthy in this world, walk in victory. And finally, we are to stand, not run away, not fall down, stand. I believe God is calling us to take a stand. Martin Luther took a stand. All the great men and women of God that have been used have taken a stand. But how are we to stand? Stand in the power of the Lord and take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, stand against all the wiles, the tricks, the deceptions, his devices of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in high places, Satan, the devil, and his organized forces. Now, when we come to this question of spiritual warfare, there are two dangers, two ditches. The one is to ignore it, deny it, say it doesn't exist. There are many believers like that. They pretend that there is no devil. They do not recognize that there is a spiritual warfare out there. But the other danger, the other ditch, is an unhealthy interest in that subject. And they see a demon behind every stump, 
behind every problem, every situation, and they come into the service rebuking the devil. Listen, we're to come into the presence of God with thanksgiving and praise and worship because of the great victory of Calvary. So, the Bible says we are not ignorant of his devices. What are his devices? When you study the scriptures, the first thing we are showing very clearly is that the devil is a deceiver. He's a liar. One of the signs of the last days is deception. And so we need to be aware of the deception of the devil, his lies, the way he seeks to deceive. Secondly, the word devil really means to cast between in order to bring division between two people or two parties. Debulus, to cast between, to bring division. The devil deceives and he divides. He tries to bring division between husband and wife. He tries to bring division into the church. He starts a rumor. He starts something going, mistrust, and he'll bring division into a church. He'll bring division into a nation. He divides. He deceives. He divides. But he also destroys, devours. Peter says the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Don't give place to the devil. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. How can I do that? How do I give place to the devil? By harboring bitterness, anger, unforgiveness in your heart. Forgive even as God in Christ has forgiven you. The devil deceives, he divides, he discourages. Ah, that one. You ever felt discouraged? No wonder the Lord said to Joshua about three times, and then the people added, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong. That's when Joshua became the new leader. The enemy seeks to discourage us. I remember Brother McLean preaching on Joshua 1. I think it was at my ordination. He said, you know, a Christian had a dream. And in this dream, he found himself in the devil's tool shop. And he saw all these tools, and they all had a name on them, a tag. And so as the devil was leading this Christian around, there was one, it had been used very, very much. You could see it was worn. And the Christian said, well, what's the name of this tool? Oh, he said with glee, that's discouragement. I use this against Christians, and especially against preachers. Ah, listen, guard against discouragement. We need to guard against this. There are so many, it seems, these days who have the gift of discouragement. They discourage people by what they say, by what they do. May God help us to be encouragers, encouraging one another. That word exhortation means to encourage. May God raise up many with the gift of exhortation, encouragement. The devil deceives. He divides, he discourages. But listen, I want to put another D there. The devil has been legally defeated. He has been defeated. Principalities, powers, wicked spirits, Satan himself, they are legally under Christ's feet. We read that in Ephesians 1. And our spiritual eyes need to be enlightened so we see that God has raised us up to that same place of victory. Listen, God sees you in his son, a place of victory. 
He sees you as more than a conqueror. And listen, I'll tell you something else. The devil sees you in Christ. He knows you're there. He, he knows it's a place of victory, but he tries to blind our spiritual eyes. So we don't see ourselves as God sees us. Look at yourself, talk about yourself as God sees you, not as the devil wants you to feel. Now it says, take the whole armor of God. Notice the first is the belt of truth. Thy word is truth. Thank God for the Bible. From cover to cover, the inspired, infallible, inerrant. Might not sin against thee. Oh, listen, this is the only sure foundation in times of storm, for your marriage, for your business, for your ministry, built on the solid word of God. Take the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. We have been clothed with his righteousness. Let us as believers live lives that are godly and righteous in his sight, not giving any place to the enemy. Then it speaks about the shield of faith or your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. May we be ready at all times to share the gospel of peace. Yeah. Hallelujah. We have good news in a world filled with bad news. We have the gospel of peace. Then it says taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts, the missiles the enemy shoots. Back in those days, they sometimes would light an arrow and shoot it into, the, into where they were trying to conquer. The enemy shoots fiery darts of doubt and fear and discouragement. Take the shield of faith. Be strong in faith. The Bible says that those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Yeah. You know, all those saints in Hebrews 11 who obtained a good report obtained it by faith. And if you read it carefully, it was persevering faith. God has saved us by grace through faith. We are called to walk by faith. We are called to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The word of God is living and it ministers faith as we hear it. That's why we need to feed on the word of God. We need to memorize the word of God and we need to become strong in faith. Take the shield of faith. Listen. Listen. The enemy will shoot darts of doubt, fear, discouragement. Put the shield of faith up. I believe God. I believe the promise of God. I believe that in Christ I am victor. I believe that if God be for us, nothing can be against us. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. Hold fast the confession of your faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Yeah. Take the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. In those days, they wore a helmet of brass or metal or leather because sometimes the enemy would take a club and wallop the enemy who they were attacking with a club. The enemy attacks our minds. Yeah. Do you hear me? The enemy attacks our minds. Listen to this scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, 
casting down imaginations, reasonings, and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is God's word. This is his word, living, inerrant word. The devil will try to put doubts into your mind. The enemy attacks us through our mind. He gets us to think a wrong thought. If we open our mind, that thought will take root. And eventually, it'll cause you to fall. You cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop that bird from building a nest in your hair. Don't allow the enemy to build a stronghold in your mind. We talk, talk about strongholds in cities that the devil builds. The enemy also seeks to build a stronghold of worry, of being negative, of unbelief, of doubt. I know all about this. I've gone through it. I left Bible school. I felt God called me as an evangelist in my first campaign. After graduating, I was in Oliver, B.C., and I was preaching there in a little church. During the day, I was going door to door, giving out gospel tracts, inviting people to come. But many times during the day, I was on my knees going through a battle. I was preaching the Bible, but the enemy was saying, how do you know that's true? How do you know that's right? How can you prove it? There was a battle raging in my mind. I felt like someone had a rope tied around my head and pulling it tighter and tighter until I thought my brain would snap. A battle of the mind, the battle of the brain. The enemy was seeking to build a stronghold of doubt, of questioning the word of God. In the evening, I had to get up and preach, <laughs> preach the gospel, believe God. During the day, I was going through this battle. On the last Sunday, a team came from Vancouver to Oliver, B.C. They knew nothing about it. And I can remember Len Hearn, missionary to Cuba, and then Mexico, getting up and preaching. If you can believe, you'll see the glory of God. I said, thank you, Lord, you're answering. And then a man by the name of Gaius Bell, Brethren background, he got up and he began to speak. You would think someone would have told him all about me. <laughs> he spoke about what I was going through, the battle I was going through, why I was going through it, how to overcome it. When he finished, I felt like I was out of a prison. Knowing the truth set me free. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Now, the enemy came back many times after us, but I knew what I was going through. I knew how to overcome it. And that's why I am such a strong believer in knowing the scriptures, standing on the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, speaking the word of God. When Billy Graham was invited to Los Angeles for that crusade in 1948, Chuck Templeton came to see him before the crusade and said, Billy, you can't really take the word of God literally. You can't really preach the old-fashioned way you used to preach. You've got to now be modern. You know, you can't take things like they really, you got to. And he did everything he could to sow doubts in Billy Graham's mind. Billy Graham was facing a crusade. He's supposed to preach the word of God. And here Chuck Templeton, his friend with whom he had worked, is now seeking to put doubts in his mind. Billy Graham says, I went out into the forest. All there was for light was the moonlight. And I opened my Bible and I put it on a stump and I knelt down and I said, God, I don't understand everything in your word. But Lord, I'm going to accept this as your word from cover to cover. 
I am going to believe it. I'm going to preach it. It's your inspired, inerrant word. I'm going to preach this as your living, powerful word. He says, I felt the power and presence of God in a way that I hadn't for a long time. And that's why Billy Graham, throughout his ministry, said, the Bible says, the Bible says, and he quoted the scripture. Listen, the word of God is like a hammer. It'll break the rock in pieces. It is like a sharp two-edged sword. It'll pierce home to the hearts of people. Preach the word. Live the word. Speak the word. Stand on the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit. Oh. How did Jesus overcome the devil? It is written. It is written again. He gave the devil a thrust with a two-edged sword. Believer, when you're tempted, quote the scripture. When the enemy tries to bring discouragement, quote the scripture. When you're going through a battle, read the word of God. Quote the scripture. Use the word of God as a sharp two-edged sword. It says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, the word of God is living, it is powerful, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not naked. And it's, notice the word his. The written word of God should lead us to Jesus, the living word. Jesus said, search the scriptures because they testify of me. The scriptures, the word of God, take the sword of the spirit. And then Paul says, praying always. This is also a weapon. The word of God is a weapon. The name of Jesus is a weapon. We use his name in prayer. We use his name against the enemy. We stand upon his finished work, his shed blood. But prayer is also a powerful weapon. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. It says with perseverance, we need to be a praying people. Listen, my house shall be called a house of prayer, said Jesus. Read the life of Jesus on earth. He was again and again alone in prayer. That's why he was always anointed of the Holy Spirit to minister. Be strong in the word. Be strong in the spirit. Be strong in the Lord. But may God help us to be strong in prayer. James 5.16 in the Amplified Bible says, The heartfelt Continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in his working. You read the book of Acts. When they were threatened not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, those were demonic spirits working through the religious leaders, commanding them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. How did they overcome those principalities and powers? They spoke about Jesus still being Lord. And then they prayed that signs and wonders would be done in the name of his holy servant Jesus and that they would be able to continue to boldly preach the word of God. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled and they spake the word of God with boldness. There are strongholds of the enemy. There are principalities that rule over cities. There are powers that rule over Calgary, over Alberta. Principalities, that's one level of demonic authority. Powers is another. The rulers of the darkness of this world there are wicked spirits that are endeavoring to take control of the governmental authorities 
of our city, of our province, of our nation, to lead our nation into darkness. We as God's people need to take the whole armor of God. We need to be strong in the Lord in these days. And we go forth with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. We go forth with a two-edged sword and the high praises of God in our mouths. We go forward in faith. We go forward in the power of His Word, power of His Spirit, taking the sword of the Spirit. And I believe He will lead us from victory unto victory. Ah, listen. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. He is Lord. He is risen. I'm going to ask the music team to come. Let's stand together. I have sought to bring the message that I felt the Lord lay in my heart. And if you are here, I trust that the word of God has ministered to you. You'll go away with a sense of victory in your heart. But if you feel you need prayer, we'll be glad to come. We're here. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you. So we'll be down here. The elders are here. If there are those who want prayer for any need, please come. We'll be glad to minister to you.